we will be going to Benin City uh, to speak with the executive governor of Edo State, Governor Godwin Obaseke. You're welcome to the program, Governor. I hope you can hear me clearly. Thank you. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. All right. First of all, we'd like to thank you uh, for the work you are doing on behalf of your people and also of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. The first question we're going to ask is this. Um, as Chief Executive Officer of your state, uh, can you just give us a status assessment of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in your state? Uh, what are the structures that you have put in place to stop the spread of this virus have lost your as we are tied to the phase me? of gradual reopening of the economy? Sorry, I couldn't, I didn't, you broke for a while. Can you just repeat the question? Okay. As the chief executive officer of your state, can you give us a status assessment of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in your state? What are the structures that you have put in place to stop the spread of the virus as we enter into the phase of gradual reopening of the economy? Uh, thank you very much. Um, as you know, um, Edo State is, occupies a very strategic geographical position in, the state, in this country. Um, logistically, we, you cannot go from the western part of the country to the east or to the south-south, and sometimes to the north without going through Edo. Mm. So um, it's a logistic hub, it's a transportation hub, and quite a lot of, a bit of our economy is dependent on our location. And so with the lockdown and shutdown across the country, you can imagine the impact on transportation, on um, logistics, on supplies, on you know, the whole value chain that our economy supports. And uh, also, don't forget that we have a very large diaspora, particularly in Europe. And at the advent of COVID-19, we realized that quite a few of them started coming back home. And that created a scare for us because we did not know how many came back infected and many of them did not go into self-isolation. On the social side, I mean, you know how boisterous our people are, I do perhaps ranks amongst the top locations in terms of the evangelical religious movements in this country. So our people are very, uh, very religious, so they love going to church. And so with the pandemic, all of that, religious activities, um, economic activities, social activities, just all, all came to a grinding halt. Um, the population in Edo is of the economy is largely dependent on the informal sector. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of service uh, going on to support the economy I have described. So with the pandemic and the shutdown, you can imagine the economic hardship our people have faced. And so as chief executive, I had to make a very difficult decision between a panic reaction of just shutting down the state entirely without understanding how I could support the livelihoods and economic activities, and ensuring that I protect and safeguard the health of my people. So it's that delicate balance uh, that we have tried to maintain. And in doing so, we decided to develop a very robust approach to uh, fighting the pandemic. And we approached it from three main perspectives. First governance. Everything in life, every process you need to undertake depends on the governance structure you put in place. So I'm very happy to say that if you have a very robust governance structure to fight COVID-19, I have a response team I chair and I meet with every day and we've done so for the last four weeks to develop plans, strategies and programs. The other pillar or the other key factor has been partnerships. We know that we cannot do it ourselves. So we've thought, you know, thought about leveraging on the partnerships we have. Fortunately for us in Edo, we have three strong federal government health facilities. The University of Benin Teaching Hospital, the Ira Specialist 
Tichin Hospital and the Neuropsychiatric Hospital with the manpower that is available in these institutions, coupled with a very rich pool of private medical practitioners in the state. We've been able to leverage these, these human resources to develop a very robust plan. The, the last um, aspect of the, the strategy focusing on communication. You know, because over the last few years, we've commenced, we commenced a reform in the state where we have ensured that we reach our people, we build trust with our people. The majority of people in the state now believe government, believe that government means well, and that believe that government will look out for their interest. So we've emphasized communication, trying to make sure that our people know and realize that COVID-19 is real and portends great dangers for us. In organizing the way we responded, we've looked at, we looked at the entire spectrum and created six pillars to respond. The first was to focus on people, the manpower. And like I said, fortunately, we have a rich pool of medical personnel in the state, ranging from specialist consultants in teaching hospitals with doctors in the public and private hospitals to community health workers at the local government level. We've leveraged the entire spectrum and pulled them together uh, and began to sensitize and train them on how to respond to COVID-19. We were able to train about 4,200 um, health workers in the about four weeks ago, the first, you know, we set up the committee and we've continued to, you know, adopt the trade, the trainer uh, system and have ensured that as, you know, as you get even at the local government levels, at the, pro the pri uh, primary health care centers, we have trained all our health workers. So they, are, they all know what COVID-19 is about. We've given them uh, protective personal equipment. Uh, we've given them support to, uh, to, to cope with the pandemic. We also focused on making sure that we have the facilities to treat people. And as I'll tell you later, the strategy we've adopted, mm -hmm. we've looked at private clinics, we looked at uh, hospitals, we've looked at private, care, uh, private uh, providers, private clinics, and even pharmacies. Mm -hmm. And right now we're talking to patent medicine stores that have a large pool of people who come in to buy medicines. And we've set up screening centers in each, most of these facilities. Our goal is to roll out between two and 300 um, screening centers across the state. We rolled out the first 40 um, in the South where we have a lot more of the cases. And the plan is in the next two weeks, we should be able to roll out um, the rest of the screening centers. From the screening centers, we, we have the technology that where we collect information from people who are screened and where we find cases or suspected cases. Those people are samples are taken, tested, and while that is happening, we charge them into our health facilities for, for you know to watch them before the results come in. And if they are positive, then we take them to our solution center. Uh, today, we have isolation capacity of about 500 beds spread across the state. We have the main isolation facility, which is the Stella Basenjo um, Hospital. I had to evacuate everyone from that hospital um, to set up a 300 bed isolation facility. That facility is up and running. And there's, we still have some work to complete the ICU and you know a few other things in there. But by the end of next week, it will, it will be fully ready to accommodate 300 people. We also have an isolation facility at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital. Um, I went there a couple of days ago to provide additional support. 
uh, for about 50 beds. We have an isolation center at the Irod uh, Specialist Hospital in Edo Central. And we've also built an isolation center at the Auchi General Hospital in Auchi. The other uh, thing we've done about the facilities we have is to focus on testing. We are fortunate in Edo, like I said, to have a strong federal medical presence. And as you may know, the ERA Specialist Teaching Hospital is one of the centers of excellence on the continent for infectious diseases. Um, a couple of years ago, we partnered with that hospital, put in some state resources to strengthen their capacity to respond to NASA fever. Um, they helped in training quite a lot of our community health workers. And we, today in Edo, have, are proud to say that we have perhaps one of the best contact tracing teams in the country. And that's why we were able to quickly respond at the beginning of the outbreak to track uh, potential uh, uh, cases. All right. Uh, so I could go on and on and on, you know, we've, we've done so many other things, including ensuring that we have a very strong logistic support for the operations, ensure that we organize security to back up what we're doing. And the core and kernel, of, uh, the two key things that are critical in the success, that will determine your success in the fight against any pandemic, uh, first, how you communicate, how you communicate what you're doing to the people who are affected and how you get feedback. So communication has been very, very strong. And in this regard, again, we partnered with all the media, you know, uh, bloggers, radio stations, uh, public or private, television stations. We use the town criers um, from, you know, the local governments down to the communities. Uh, so we leverage every communication platform we have to ensure that we get the message done. And then lastly, the kernel of any response is your incidents management. When you hear of cases or you have suspected cases, how do you go to ensure that you're able to reach those people? Where you have people who have tested positive, how can you quickly trace all every contacts they've been in touch with and quickly bring them for testing and also in doing i mean and making sure that you also bring them to care and treatment and in doing this you have to show empathy you have to show concern you have to show um you know love i guess the last word uh what are, you know last point i want to make is that the messaging about covid 19 is key and real um, and it's key because what we found is in the beginning, you tell people, yes, wash your hands, keep a safe distance. Um, and they didn't really, really understand why. So we had to break it down to explain that this is what happens. This is the nature of the virus. If you wash your hands regularly, even when you touch surfaces where, those, you know, uh, where the droplets are, you may not be affected. And, but more importantly, we then gleaned from the experience of countries where they have successfully fought uh, this virus to make sure to, to, to insist that to enhance your head, we should wear face masks. So in Edo today, we, I believe we're one of the first states in the country to make the use of face masks in public spaces compulsory. And I've, and, you know, we've, facilities without wearing your mask. All right. Um, you actually have answered a lot of the questions we're going to ask with um, your detailed explanation. So I'll ask this on the economic front, um, because this pandemic has the balance between the health and then the economic front. On this economic front, this pandemic will no doubt have had uh, some a significant impact on people's lives especially with the lockdown. Um, so can you just tell us um, your strategy to ease 
uh, the negative effect on business activities within your state and, and also to reduce the economic impact on the citizens. Are there things you're going to put in place for this? Um, yes, as I said when I, you know, in my opening uh, uh, remarks, that Edo, the economy of Edo State, first, it's largely agrarian. Um, secondly, it's also because of the strategic location of the state, it's also service dependent. And most of the people who provide services or grow food are in the informal sector. Yes, we have a few large plantations, but the rest of the agri value chain is driven by you know, smallholder farms, small farmers uh, who operate in the informal sector. So if they don't go to work, if they don't farm, or they don't sell, they are not going to be able to fend for themselves. Uh, so it's that, and 80% of the economy of the state is dependent on these people, and 80% of the employment in the state is driven by, this, uh, by the informal economy. So, we, so that informed our decision to undertake gradual restrictions. That is why we did not, despite all the pressure, enforce a total lockdown of the state. We did, you know, gradually shut down a few um, most important, you know, areas where people aggregated the largest um, schools, the public servants from level one to 12 work from home. We relocated markets from, the, you know, where they really are to open spaces to be able to enforce social distancing. But we kept them open and we've kept all of them open. Um, we've, we, we've, we, while not encouraging people, encouraging people to try and stay at home as much as possible, for those who had to go to work, we just said, look, try and protect yourself. Make sure you wear face masks. I think our whole strategy has been to ensure that we, with a communication to our people, uh, to make them understand that fighting COVID-19 is a shared responsibility. It's not the sole responsibility of government. Government will provide leadership and direction but the disease will affect individuals and families. So they must also take an interest and understand how to cope. It is, government does not want to punish them, you know, by shutting down their businesses, by starving them. If they must go about their economic activities, then they must protect themselves. So that's the approach we used in, um, and we did not shut down the economy wholesale, uh, wholesale you know, the transportation, uh, the people who run the transportation industry, the uh, buses, the transporters were allowed to, as long as they enforced social uh, uh, social distances distancing within their buses and uh, vehicles. We also looked at the issue of palliatives, because clearly um, with uh, the lockdown, many people were thrown out of work. You know, imagine the young man who hawks bread to the transporters coming in from Lagos on their way to Nietzsche or to Otakot. I mean, at, those people have been out of work for close to six weeks and they need to survive. And for, so for people like that, who have become vulnerable, who've become, who have been driven further down into adverse poverty, we've provided palliatives. We have a relief committee and um, using state resources. Uh, it's only in the last few days or weeks that we've been receiving um, support in terms of food and medicines, but we, we had to do something before we got to get support. And uh, we've bought, we bought food stuff um, and got some cash, which we have tried to distribute to the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable. And we've done that through the churches uh, who have been very, very supportive. I mean, all the church leaders in the States um, meet with me regularly, um, and they have supported our efforts and our fight. I mean, you know, our fight in this area. We've also used our traditional system. We have very robust traditional administration, as you know, um, from the palace down to the dukes in the various um, you know, areas down to the heads of communities. We've used them to identify those who are 
who have become, who have become very weak as a result of the pandemic and to try and bring succor and support. And in the last one week, we've also, you know, deepened the message, you know, to say, look, um, people should be their brother's keepers. Everybody needs to give something to support those who are weaker. So palliatives shouldn't be dependent only on government or only the very wealthy in society. My civil servants who had received salaries for the salaries last month, for instance, and asked them, what are you doing? How are you going to, how are you given to support those who have not been able to earn any income? So we've approached the, you know, the, you know, the economic sustenance from first ensuring that we don't shut down everyone totally, making sure that um, you know, the restrictions have been gradual. We, the only the major restriction we have now is a night curfew, but during the day, people are you know, allowed to go about their economic, economic activities, albeit ensuring that they maintain social, um, effective social distancing. And then for those who have been had as heats, we are, um, you know, we've been sending them relief materials. And what we've now decided to do, or working with some of the telecommunication companies, is drawing up a very elaborate and robust social register. I'm working with the four telecom companies. We've gotten data. We know those people in our states who don't cannot afford more than three to five hundred, uh, three, about three hundred naira a month to charge their phones. Who have analog phones, or who don't even have phones; they only have SIM cards. We're identifying those. We have about one hundred and twenty-five thousand of them now, and we are going to working with uh, some, other, some of our financial institutions. We're going to create electronic wallets to see how we can now begin to transfer money to them until we get out of this unfortunate situation. All right. Thank you very much, um, Governor. Uh, thank you for lending us some of your time um, during this most busy time for executives. Uh, keep up the good work, sir. Thank you. And God bless you. And I have with me my special guest right back in the studio with me. We had to take a short break, but I welcome you back, Mr. Soji Akinkube and Mr. Funsho Shubande. I will just pick up our comments from our conversation from where we were before. I know you were talking about education and your audio wasn't too clear. So I just wanted to reiterate some of the things that you were talking about when you were talking about education and how we should look at the state of education right now through all of the things that we are going through. Okay, well, thank you for having me again. I think that um, um, we're at a point of inflection, and uh, yes, we will rise out of it, but how high we want to rise also depends on how much we want to invest in it. You know? So um, I think that we need to have a frank conversation about our situation with our education. We need to have an audit, an uh, unbiased audit, whether it's a private school, whether it's a public school, and also industry. You know, the world is moving at such, such a pace now that you have to have all your tools with you to be able to compete. You know, we're going from uh, moving from um, biofuels, we're going into green energy, um, the whole agriculture is morphing, um, education, as, you, as we are seeing, you know, the online opportunity um, is definitely going to be real going forward, you know, not to talk about industry um, and how all this is going to affect industry. So I think that for a country like Nigeria that has a huge population and a young population, and the also advantage of Nigerians is that we are very ambitious. So that you've got youth, you've got um, ambition, you've got drive, you've got, and then you then have, unfortunately, as we have today, a large percentage of your population are not able to be channeled positively into the mainstream, you know, of society, you know. So I think that I, I don't have all the answers. But as I said, my own experience, you know, as an entrepreneur has led me to understand that that is the bedrock of a society. And a society has to invest 
I mean, one of the biggest funders of our healthcare, of our, you know, of th this whole uh, engagement is Bill Gates. Bill Gates, as we all know, didn't is a drop out from Harvard. But you know, the fundamental education that he had is what has driven him to the enormous heights that he is today. So I think that it's, as I, as I said, we need to have that frank conversation. We need to say this is where we are. And this is without any face painting, any coating, just frank, you know? I mean, no matter how low a man is, is not the issue. The man is decided that, look, he wants to be told what it is, and then he begins to decide how best to go forward. So we have the frank conversation. We decide that, look, of course, even within the structure itself, some states are a little bit ahead of others. We say it as it is. Let's not deny the obvious, you know, and then we then see how we, where we want to be over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. And then it becomes more or less, regardless of the party, regardless of politics, this is what we must drive for. Because at the end of the day, it's not the parties, it is us. So for me, what we've taken out of this is that we're still going back to the basics, education and health. Yes, we may not have the um, first class health facilities. Well, as a doctor, 95% um, of our health is treatable between the, within the preventive health um, system. So we must have a very robust preventive health system, whether it's basic vaccinations, malnutrition, good nutrition, pipe bone water, you know, at least the basic things that will be able to, that will give everybody the platform, you know, to be able to be um, um, well enough to be able to fight diseases. I mean, even as we've seen, even in this with COVID state, um, obviously the older generation are more prone because of the fact that they have on the line. But obviously if you are younger and your health is obviously not as good as it should be, then you're also prone. You know, so whichever way you look at... I think it's just for the older No, you know, I mean, you know, we also see here that, I mean, somebody who's been battered with cholera, you know, has a poor immune system, is not eating well, naturally, that's a candidate for, you know, is vulnerable. Yes. You know, so I think that, you know, we must be able to have those frank conversations, and this must be with all gloves pulled off, you know. I think that Nigeria deserves it, you know. This is not about a particular party or this, that, or the other. This is about what it is. And we must be able to say it to each other. Thank you, Mr. Kimbe. Thank you so much for that. Mr. Shibane, I'm coming back to you. We, we are talking about family, we talked about faith, and we talked about fitness. So freedom and finance. It's a good time to look at our finances during this period. That's because a very important conversation. It is a very, very important. <laughs> like I said to people, I said, look, for those people who received a paycheck, you know, this last pay cycle. Mm. Um, you need to treasure that paycheck because you don't know if it's going to be the last. Part of the, um, on, well, some of the consequences of the lockdown is that many businesses are having to restructure and, and to see how they can carry out their operations safely, but they also need to think about recouping the losses from the lockdown period. And many people are finding out that they can run their businesses probably as efficiently with perhaps less number of staff. So there could be layoffs as a side effect and stuff. So the conversation about finance is a very important conversation to be having at this time. How many husbands or spouses know what their partner really earns or how they spend it? That's a conversation they should be having. Who's paying for what? You know, who covers what expense? Then they must also have some other frank discussions, you know, uh, the era of hiding your assets away from your partner and stuff like that is coming to an end. Nobody, everybody wants to make sure that by the time they leave this side of the divide, they have made some adequate provision for their loved ones yes. and so on and so forth. So it's a time to talk about wheels and all those morbid stuff. Because if you look at the, um, the, the, the death toll as a result of this pandemic in other uh, geographies and so on and so forth, you find out that if you didn't have some tough conversations, um, some people you, you, might just be left with debts and with baggage that carry. others have left behind. So the conversations around finance are very, very important. Also, um, 
some people see it as an opportunity to save or to invest. Now, a word of caution there. Savings, I can see. Uh, most people, we've, we've benefited from a subsidy on fuel prices, for example. But at the same time, that subsidy has come at a time when you and I are unable to harvest the dividend because we are not moving around. We're not driving our cars and so on and so forth, at least in the key lockdown states. In other states, perhaps they are. So could you possibly save some of the money you would have spent on some of those other activities? Yes, it could be offset by an increase in you know, expenses around maybe internet and you know, communications and stuff like that. But the, I still believe that there may have been an opportunity to make some savings in this period. If you look also at investment, opportunities would have come up for some people in terms of uh, the crash in the stock prices on the stock exchange and asset prices, real estate, and so on and so forth. But the note of caution I have to sound there is people have to reappraise their investment appetite. You see, it's a time where you want to stay as close as possible into, in cash or uh, assets that can convert to cash rather easily because you need to gauge your staying appetite. Otherwise, you take a decision today that you might find is either going south very quickly and is very difficult to unwind. So that's the conversation in the space of finances. Um, I know many people have done lots of talks and webinars on, in that area as well. It's a continuous conversation it's, really yeah. because as everything evolves, it's people's eyes are opening day by day by day. And I think sometimes the reality has not even really set in for many people, the reality of how deep the impact might be. You know, and people are hopeful, but at the same time need to be real, yes. which is what Mr. Kinkukwe was saying. But your last point, freedom, okay. is very interesting. Explain yes. freedom. Freedom, when I talk of freedom, I'm talking more about the freedoms we take for granted mm. in our everyday life, which suddenly in the lockdown uh, dispensation, we are coming to appreciate. For example, we used to have the freedom to come here to worship in a church. We had you know, freedom to go to a salon to get your hair done. You had freedom to travel easily across borders and so on and so forth. Guess what has happened? In the travel space, even when, uh, post lockdown, I see a situation where travel will only be easy for those who have um, you know, dual citizenship because you would probably only be able to travel very quickly to countries that have opened their borders and with whom you have ease of access. You know, so in that dispensation of freedom, it's, it's more about an appreciation or cherishing those things that we now see is, um, we, that we have taken to, for granted oh, right. over time. You know, it's a time to appreciate them and to see how we can reconfigure our lives to ensure that those um, activities, we can still continue to do them. And I dare say that after the lockdown period, we'll place a, a higher premium on, uh, you on know, accessing those yeah. freedom. Thank you. Thank you both so much. A lot to think about. It's also really a time of reflection. It is. It's a time of deep reflection. And I hope that we all learn and continue to learn from this and don't return to the old normal, but somehow craft a better new normal. Well, the truth is that um, <laughs> our habits are hard to kill in this country and we, we tend not to learn from lessons. We will learn from these Amen. ones. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kingwe. Thank you, Mr. Thank Shibandi. You, Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We that. have to go straight back to the main stage now. The Platform Nigeria celebrates all medical and frontline workers in the battle against this epidemic. Some have given their lives to keep us safe. Nigeria and the world will forever be grateful to you all.